All right. Welcome back for another fun-filled episode of the Fit40 Podcast. Today, we're going to be covering three popular topics based on discussions I've had with people throughout the week, whether it be clients, members of Fit40 family, or just random people. I just love to help. And these are common topics that come up. So we're going to talk about them one by one so that you're in a really good spot just in case you come across any of these issues. So we're going to talk about number one, how to get rid of the apron belly. Number two, why ideal body weight is bullshit. And number three, eating more to lose weight. Just going in depth on exactly what that is and how to use it to your advantage. So let's tackle eating more to lose weight first. It is very misunderstood. It's poorly implemented, but it's kind of true. So what most people think is that you just eat more food the exact same way, and that's going to spark your metabolism and let your body fire on all cylinders and everything's going to go swimmingly and you're just going to, the fat is going to melt away. But that's not what happens, especially if you're the type of person who hasn't seen any movement in the scale or has been gaining weight. If you start eating exactly what you're eating, but more, you will gain weight. That's how this works. And another thing people think is I just got to avoid starvation mode. What is starvation mode? It's not a thing. It just is not a thing. It, too few calories, when you eat too few calories, whatever that is for you, it, that will result in you pulling uh, energy from your lean body mass and your fat stores. Because when you are low on energy, which is what calories are, which is what your fat stores are holding, okay, that is an energy source. It's going to pull from that. That's why when you're in a calorie deficit, which is a negative energy balance, we need to fill that energy balance, that deficit with something from somewhere. And that is your fat stores and your lean body mass. If you don't eat enough protein and stay active, or if you just go way too low in calories. Okay. Now that being said, everyone's calories are different. So I, I say this and the like trigger reaction is like, you don't know me. I have this going on. I have this condition. I take these medications and I totally get it. I'm not saying that those don't make it harder, but if you were to eat absolutely nothing, if you were to bring all your calories down to zero, you would lose weight regardless of your condition, regardless of whatever you got going on, because otherwise you would die. Okay. So everybody has that limit. Now, the problem is a lot of people, that limit is not sustainable because of medications you're taking, because of conditions that you're dealing with, because of lifestyle factors, or there's a million reasons it could be, but let's all agree on the fact that starvation mode is not a thing at a certain calorie point, everyone will lose weight or they will die. Okay. Now, Metabolic adaptation, this is a real thing. This is something that people mix up starvation mode with. Okay? It's a very, very real thing. And it happens when your basal metabolic rate is reduced due to lower body weight and, and or size or losing muscle mass. Okay, It also can happen when your non-exercise activity thermogenesis goes down because you are so tired all the time. You're not doing all these micro movements because your calories are just so damn low. And then this is one of those things that makes it harder to lose weight. And your BMR is very reflective of your body size, like I was just saying. So you losing body fat, you getting smaller, you losing inches and losing body weight requires less energy to be burned to maintain. This is what the adaptation is that's happening. It's totally normal. And this is why when people start off at a certain calorie target, they see really, really good results in the beginning, but as they keep doing it, they lose at a slower rate or it just stops completely and they plateau. So that's where other strategies need to come in. But this is just a normal process that your body goes through again, to keep you alive. So you don't die. So how should you eat more to lose weight? Well, when we talk about eating more, it's usually eating more at specific times, most likely at breakfast and lunch, because most people do tend to eat like pigeons when it comes to breakfast and lunch. It's a protein bar, or it's a tiny salad, or it's like cheese and nuts that are really a snack. Like that's really what these are. Breakfast and lunch turn into snacks, and then the only meal you actually get is dinner time. And by that time, you're ravenous. And then that will lead to eating eating way more later in the day, or if this is like during the week and you're eating next to nothing during the week, the weekend, all of a sudden the hunger hits and all the cravings hit and you just go on a binge fest and you get a case of the buckets and the calorie count just goes way up because that's the real kicker here is the fact that you can eat 500 calories a day, Monday through Friday, 
But if you go buck wild on the weekend, your weekly calories are going to be so high that you either maintain or gain weight, which a lot of people do experience. So try and eat more at breakfast, more at lunch. They've actually done studies that show that many people, when they increase their calories at breakfast time, have a much easier time regulating their appetite throughout the day and make better food, deci food decisions overall. And they have more energy throughout the day. So you're actually going to be burning more calories through non-exercise activity because you have that energy. So if you want to control for your hunger and burn more calories, eat earlier in the day. Okay. It's ideal if you could get like about the same amount of calories throughout each meal. So if you have say a calorie budget of 1500 calories, try and make every meal four to 500 calories and leave a couple hundred extra for a snack. If you want really simple, um, not easy, simple. <laughs> now, uh, that also applies to more calories earlier in the week. So if you are trying to save a ton of calories for this big thing coming up over the weekend, don't push it too far. Because again, you're going to drive those cravings crazy. You are going to be very, very hungry and you're probably going to be very low energy. And when you feel like crap, you make crap decisions and you're more likely to go way over your calorie target to the point where it messes up your entire week and it was all for nothing. Okay. And this is all in the context of trying to maintain or reduce your body weight. If you're trying to gain weight, great. <laughs> I'm not going to say great strategy, but it is an effective strategy. We can agree on that. Um, and then also eating higher volume, nutrient dense foods. So it might not be eat more calories. It might just be eat food, not supplements, not bars for the majority of your day have actual food because when you have these things like vegetables, for example, that are very, very high volume, you get a lot of them for very little calories. What that does is it helps you feel more full on less calories. So in your stomach, it is filling up with all of these foods and it's pressing against the inner lining of your stomach, which is going to send a signal up to your brain saying, hey, we're filling up down here. And this is a signal that you don't get when you have ultra high processed foods and like these bars, these shakes, because it's not really filling your stomach up. So you have to eat more and more and more of those to get that signal to the point where, okay, your brain actually knows, hey, we're filling up down here. Only difference when it's on whole and minimally processed foods, like the, the stuff that we want to eat more of, the healthier foods, that will come at a cost of way less calories than the ultra processed foods, than the bars and the shakes. So if you can try and get more lean protein and vegetables and fruit. All right, on to the next one. Why ideal body weight is bullshit. Okay, it isn't based on multiple health factors. For many, it's unachievable and it honestly should be, and it can do more harm than good. Now, where does it come from? Okay, there's multiple different formulas that are used for multiple different things. Okay, the ideal body weight formula only takes into account your height. There's a little bit of a typo here for anybody watching on YouTube. I put just height and it came out far height. So, here we are. We're doing it live. Um, the divine method is another one that's used, and that only takes into account your height and gender. BMI is just your height and weight. And then the adjusted body weight, the ABW, is height, weight, and sex. So all of those have very glaring problems when it comes to your overall health, which is why we don't want ideal body weight to be that main target, that big thing, that, that goal that we're trying to achieve, because there's so many things missing. Okay, none of them account for muscle mass, bone density, body composition, cardiovascular health, or your blood work, which are way more important than whatever the scale says. So what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. All right. Some of you guys might be a little too young for that reference, but I try and make these references age up. I'm only 31. I know 40, 50, 60, 70 year olds got that one. Um, <laughs> so pretty much when it comes to the ideal body weight, it really doesn't do much, but the ABW, the adjusted body weight is for medical professionals to properly dose medications because when you get your dosage based on whatever medication it is, it is very important to make sure you get that shit right. You don't want too much or too little. All right. So when it comes to overall health, living our best life, what should we focus on instead? Number one would probably be body fat percentage because that will tell you a lot more as far as your body composition goes and what you're more at risk for. Like if you have excess body fat, there are health risks that come with that. Now, you're not going to see that from BMI. Like, yes, it puts you in a bucket of people that do have these same risk factors, but 
at the end of the day, body fat's going to tell you more and more specifically, not even body fat percentage, but your lean body mass. Cause if you have more lean body mass, chances are like compared to where you're at right now, if you haven't worked out very much and you don't have a lot of muscle, if you put more muscle on, then you will likely be healthier. Your insulin sensitivity is going to improve. Joint health will improve. Your energy will improve. A lot of things happen when you increase your lean body mass, which is your muscle and your bone density. Um, next is your body fat mass. So it's kind of like when you're looking at a GPS, if you look at the estimated time, like your uh, estimated arrival, it will drive you nuts because it'll adjust here and there. Kind of like your body weight on the scale where it's like, you think everything's going right. And then bang, there's an accident on the freeway. And then all of a sudden you get time added on and you're like, what the hell? Come on. Okay. Body fat mass is more like the miles that you have traveled. So the miles are always going to go down, assuming that you're not going backwards. Okay. If you're staying on the path, if you're staying on the road, the miles will continue to dwindle regardless of the timeline. So that's why body fat mass is a really good one to keep track of if you are able to. Next is your blood work. Okay. If you exercise right, if you eat better and you do all of the right things, chances are if your blood work is not that great, it will probably improve if you are not active, if you are eating like crap and all of a sudden you flip the switch, it could be night and day. Next is VO2 max. This is starting to look like probably one of the biggest indicators of longevity and health span. If you guys have heard of that, basically if you are able to use oxygen in your body in a more efficient way. It's a very good tell of your overall health. So VO2 max is a good one. You can find that in Apple or Google health usually, and it'll give you a ballpark estimate. And they're not that far off. They're not perfect, but they're not that far off. Um, and when it comes to lean body mass, body fat percentage, body fat mass, if you Google, um, body fat calculator and use the calculator.net one, that'll do the Navy method. Again, it's not perfect and it's not super duper duper accurate. But if you take it at one point in time, and then you put in your new measurements and your new weight at another point in time, and it says you have less fat and more muscle, chances are you do. So don't rely a ton on the numbers, rely on the trends and what it's showing, because that'll probably reflect a lot of things that you're feeling and seeing. Next is your strength and like in the gym and the last thing when it comes to what to focus on is the habits that actually move the needle. Now, it's good to have all these metrics that you see, but at the end of the day, the consistency in those habits that actually make a difference is what's going to be the biggest thing that makes the biggest difference. All right. Now, next Actually, I wanted to add on to this. So if you need some good indicators and you don't want to do all the calculations and all that, the simplest way to know that you're on the right track is one, how your clothes fit. Okay. If you are constantly staring at the scale and it's not moving and you're getting frustrated, but your clothes are fitting better and better and better, screw the freaking scale. Fuck the scale. Sorry if you have kids in the car. Okay. That scale does not matter. Okay. The way that your clothes fit will indicate basically how your inches are going to be your circumference measurements. And that means that you're probably burning body fat and possibly building some muscle because muscle takes up a lot less space than fat does. So if you're the exact same weight, but your clothes fit better, you can assume that you burn body fat and gain muscle, which is an incredible thing. Your health definitely improved from that. And you should be so psyched about that instead of looking at the scale, getting down on yourself, feeling like crap. Okay. The next thing is uh, your lifts in the gym. When it comes to the lifts in the gym, like whatever you choose to do, if you are able to do more reps, if you're able to do more weight over time and feel like it's easier or do the exact same uh, or feel like it's just as hard, but you're able to lift more and more over time, that's a good sign that you're building muscle as well. Next is your daily energy. If you get that energy boost and your body is becoming more efficient, that's incredible. That's really, really good. And that's a good sign that like hormonally, you're probably in a better spot than you were before. Now it's not a guarantee, but you can kind of guess that you're probably going to be in a better spot when it comes to that. And then last but not least is your blood work. Like you can see the differences when you make these changes. I've had multiple clients tell me they go to their doctor and their doctor is super thrilled because their A1C levels are down. Their blood pressure is back to a really good uh, range. It's in a really good spot and they are just feeling better overall. And the blood work actually will show that. So going to the doctor regularly to see if you're on track is also a really good thing too. 
All right, last but not least, we got 20 minutes here. I'm gonna try and do it in 10, <laughs> okay? So um, how to get rid of the apron belly. All right, now I will admit this title pisses me off and it really annoys me. It does, okay? We need to stop, okay? Stop calling it an apron belly. Be objective because I'll get more into this, but when you label things like that, it does a lot of damage. It really does. So be objective and call it what it is. It's body fat or it's excess skin. Labeling matters a lot, okay? For anybody who's unfamiliar, and there's this thing called labeling theory, and this is one of the theories I had to learn a whole lot about in college because that degree behind me is in criminology. And that was actually what I went to school for before I learned all the nutrition and the fitness stuff. But basically, this is one of the reasons I'm very, very happy that I did a sociology-based de degree because of stuff like this. Behavior change is a big deal. And stuff like this makes a huge difference. Okay, Labeling theory is a social theory that explains how labels assigned to individuals or groups can influence their behavior and identity. It's most often associated with the sociology of crime, but it can also be applied to psychology. See, criminology, psychology, it all comes together. Okay, so how does this apply to you? If you label these areas of your body, that carries more weight than just the words, okay? It also carries shame. Why are you pointing this out and calling it something negative? Because you feel shame about it. There's guilt surrounding that. Like, how did I let myself get to this place? And there's anxiety. Like, how, who, like people are going to notice. How do people feel about this? Or how do I feel about this myself? And all this shit that really gets in the way. Because due to you basically bullying yourself by calling it this over and over and over again, that leads to self-sabotaging behaviors. Because if you're constantly putting yourself down and making fun of yourself, and you're driving your self-worth down through the floor, then why would you take care of yourself? If you're treating yourself like shit and feel like shit, why would you bother taking care of yourself? You got to flip the switch. We got to start putting positivity in your head. So we're chasing something that's rewarding instead of just beating yourself up over and over again because you're not there yet or you're not seeing what you want to see. Okay, get rid of all of these apron belly, love handles, muffin top, spare tire, pooch, jelly belly, fupa, side rolls, beer belly, mommy pouch. I know some people are laughing hearing this and it is a little bit light when we talk about it in conversation, but we really need to dive into the meaning behind all this stuff. Like we're basically pointing at a, a spot in our body and saying not good enough, or this looks horrible, or I'm so embarrassed about this. Okay. The also, the beauty of labels is that you can try different ones on. You don't need to be subscribed to this one, okay? If you label yourself as fat, lazy, unmotivated, all this stuff, you're going to do whatever fat, lazy, unmotivated people do because that's how you identify yourself. So get rid of that. Toss that label out the window starting right now. And instead, try a new one on. It might not fit, but that's okay. You want to try it on and see if it fit, if it works. And uh, this is a case of fake it till you make it. Because if you can fake feeling this way for long enough, you might start to embody the characteristics and you might actually turn into this label. So try strong. I have strong arms. I have a strong legs. I have a strong mind. Okay. Point out the things that are strong. Like if you are lifting in the gym and you're lifting good weight, then appreciate that. Or I've had like clients tell me that their kids are like, I want to be strong like mom or mom's got really strong arms. Highlight that. Screw screw the negative stuff. Talk about the positive stuff okay? or lean. Like if you're losing in certain spots, even though it might not be the spot you want to point that out and appreciate the hell out of that. Be like, hey, my efforts are being seen at this point. I can notice the difference. Um, Fit. Okay, I am a fit person because I can run around. I don't hurt all the time. I can live my life the way that I want to, unlike some of my friends that are not fit. Okay, things like that. Or last but not least, my personal favorite is grit. I have grit because I keep showing up. Even though I'm not quite where I want to be yet, I keep showing up day after day after day. I do things that are hard because I can do hard things. Okay, Those things make a big, big difference, and it can literally change your life and set you up for success when you're on the journey of trying to get into better health. All right, so that's it for this week. But before you go, if you want a simple three-step solution to do all the things that I just talked about, get yourself in a better place where you have workouts that you can do um, consistently. You have a calorie target that you can follow. You have all the tools that you need to see the success that you want. 
that's the ultimate guide to get fit over 40 that I created just for you. So if you want your copy, go to the description, go to the show notes and click there. Oh no, the alarm's going off. <laughs> okay. We still got time. Um, go to the description or the show notes and click away and get your copy today. If you're not in the fit 40 family already, get your butt in there. It's a free Facebook group where we have monthly challenges. We have one coming up for October. I think it's going to be how to kill cravings. So if that is something you're interested in and you like the motivation of the weekly uh, or sorry, monthly challenges, weekly trainings, daily tips, you got to get your butt in there. And then last but not least, if you're like, listen, I don't need any of that crap. I want the results now. I want to get my dream body. I want to burn body fat. I want to stop saying, I know what I need to do. I just got to do it. If you're the type of person who needs the accountability to get the results that you want, that's what the Fit 40 90 Day Kickstart is. So if you're interested in that, the details uh, are also in the description and the show notes. Click away, see if it's right for you, and hopefully we'll talk soon. But otherwise, until next time, go kick some ass, guys. I will see you later, and I'll see you same time, same place next week.